Welcome to SVG TV News for Friday, August 18, 2023. I'm Rochelle Batiste with the details. A national consultation to validate the findings from widespread sector consultations and present the draft legislation for the care and protection of the elderly was held here today at the NIS conference room. The purpose of the Older Persons Care and Protection Bill 2023 is to provide a legislative regime for the care and protection of older persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines by addressing problems noted by stakeholders during consultations codifying international best practices in relation to the care and protection of older persons, providing an, an authority through the National Council on Aging and create a licensing regime for homes for older persons. The Ministry of National Mobilization on behalf of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines secured support from the World Bank for the development of the legislation. Addressing the opening ceremony at the national consultation today, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of National Mobilization, Marisha French Burke said it is historic for St. Vincent and the Grenadines in its attempt to legally care and protect its greatest assets, the elderly. Our older persons helps to build and remind us of our national identity and also the history of our people and the culture that is embedded within our different spaces, our community life our way of life in particular is what we have to honor them with. But in order to do so, there are special measures that we must consider as a country when it comes to ensuring that the standard of living for our elderly is not just minimum, but setting a standard. What that standard represents will be interrogated today with you because it was through you that we all started this journey in May and June when we did all the different consultations individually. There were focus group discussions, there were um, larger settings where there were um, consultations, there were smaller settings where there were structured interviews, whether virtual and or face-to-face. -face. Now that we are at this point, it's about identifying what that preliminary information aggregatedly looks like and to see if it really represents what we all did see but it also looks at some of the key findings that will come out from the actual research that was done that um, caused us to develop a comprehensive report. But then the next step, how do we um, represent what we have written into a crafted, drafted bill? Finchburg noted that one of the key driving force that prompted the crafting of the Older Persons Care and Protection Bill 2023 was one of the impacts of the volcanic eruption in 2021 in which a number of elderly persons were neglected or abandoned. It was not the only thing, but it was one that was seen by all. And there were different stakeholders that came together including the NIS, even in the building that we are, because it was through their coordinated efforts that as a state, we were able to collectively take care of persons who were either abandoned, etc. As a state, we moved a bit further since. The, through the cabinet, we have gone to the level to now approve and implement as at April 16th, where we are now able to have a public-private partnership with two lead private sector elderly care facilities that the state is now paying for the, um, the housing and care for elderly persons who were formerly abandoned by the eruption, and not only the eruption, but there are persons that since we have started the remote support and services at the district level, 
we have found additional elderly people that have either been abandoned or living alone without help, recommended by our home health care providers and supervisors, and or the Ministry of Health, where they would not be able to take care of them outside of the medical care um, on a short-term basis. So I think those are some of the quick wins that we were able to pull out from the experience and generate a new policy direction that helps to even provide a better landscape for the, the technical areas of the draft bill um, headed by Mr. Rommel St. Hill. And it also tells of the direction from the policy areas that we are willing to go to to explore how do we further help our own people. According to P.S. Finchberg, the new piece of legislation will also look at punishment provisions to deal with cases of abandonment or those who perpetrate abuse against the elderly. Because as much as the state, through all our interventions, because we all contribute to the state's revenue, but how do we then move this a step further? And this is why we are doing this exercise. We are going to ensure that there are also provisions that will address the punishment that must be handed down. We have persons where there is financial abuse or economic abuse, where the state or other persons, there are persons who are from the diaspora that provided support for their own relatives as elderly people and they do not get the actual resources. How do we navigate around those things? And those things came out in our initial focus groups and consultations. We have to show we care, and this is a start. His address at the ceremony, Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Sinclair Prince, said he is happy with such a forum as he is of the view that they are not talking enough about, about older persons, which he calls the invisible sector, which continues to grow as the population ages. Minister Prince noted that the issue of elderly care has snowballed in recent years and now commands the attention of all stakeholders. Population growth rates of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the period 2018 to 2022 <laughs> reveals that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like other Western countries, is undergoing a demographic shift. Our population is aging. The fastest growing age group in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is that of the 75 to 79 year olds, followed by the 80 plus year olds. The implications of this, sh this shift have informed the foci of both ministries. In fact, the Ministry of Health has moved from medium priority to high priority, the provision of quality health care for the elderly. And we have experiences in this. Um, you know, we, we moved the geriatric uh, facility at Glen to, old Mon to Montrose, at the old nurses' hostel, and where we are trying to allow them to retrieve some dignity and independence um, at that particular facility and we will continue to improve because I think we have in the pipeline a new geriatric center, um, a new Lewis Bonnet home at Glen, um, facilitated of course uh, by the Maria uh, Holder um, Memorial Trust. Minister Prince said the national health policy by the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment aims to promote healthy, active and dignified lives for older persons, including addressing governance and intersectorial collaboration. This position is reflected in our guiding documents. This first draft of the national health policy, which is July 2023, states the following. Huh? A national policy on aging will be updated and approved, established providing a comprehensive framework for achieving this goal. In addition, legislation that aligns with a rights-based approach to aging and United Nations principles for older persons should be established. The geriatric services program should be strengthened through the creation of a national structure dedicated to ensuring that quality health services are delivered to older persons in an integrated and sustainable manner. Standardization, and we heard about that before, and enforcement of care models in both the public and private sectors will be pursued to ensure consistent quality of care. Of course, because of the 
the rapid expansion of the aging population, the private sector is responding to, 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 um, to, to supply. And um, that particular demand is creating some problems I, I, I hear now that you've been saying and that you'll be looking at it and I'm happy that you'll be doing so. While the existing draft national policy on aging states the following, the national policy on aging is aimed at creating a society for all ages whereby persons can live active, independent, integrated and dignified lives, free from violence and neglect in an environment where human rights are fully respected and they are allowed to participate fully in the overall development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Therefore, even as the Ministry of Health reviews with the assistance of PAHO, the administrative structure of the Geriatric Health Services Program, the, the program moves to providing more specialists geriatric health services in the primary care setting. Works towards the transformative rebuilding of the LPH, that's the Lewis Potted Home at the Glen site, and considers the construction of a facility for the elderly in the North Windward Health District to add it to the already existing facility at New Montrose. We try to decentralize. We welcome this opportunity to work with the Ministry of National Mobilization in this regard in the development of the Elderly Care and Protection Act for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Noting that the development of the Elderly Care and Protection Act for St. Vincent and the Grenadines is an output of the Ministry of Finance Implemented Services Delivery Project, which is aimed at reforming the system to which government institutions and agencies provide improved public services to the Vincentian people. A component of the project focuses on building a responsive social protection service delivery system it is coordinated by the Ministry of National Mobilization and provides for the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines' first Elderly Care and Protection Act and the revision of the Public Assistance Act. These new legislations will provide adequate protection of the rights of the elderly and improve the provisions for public assistance in the vulnerable, uh, among the vulnerable St. Vincent and the Grenadines. These legislations are being informed by the analysis of the legislative and the policy regime of this country including the before-mentioned draft national policy on aging. They will provide in part the legal framework to regulate the care provided in our public and private facilities, protect the elderly from exploitation, and support an empowering environment that allows the elderly to live fulfilling and productive lives. It is a policy which, of course, if implemented properly, is going to be a game changer in the lives of older people here at St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we need to take cognizance, cognizance of that. The Ministry looks forward to many more collaborations with the Ministry of National Mobilization, because we are happy about this collaboration here. Of course, we have joint custody of the elderly, um, one from the health standpoint and the geriatric facility, and you, of course, from the operations um, level, where you've been doing a fantastic job. So we're happy that we're with you here today, and um, I hope that the stakeholders who are with you will be able to bring forward their ideas and that you will be able to concretize those into a document which will be taken to Parliament sooner rather, sooner rather than later. Consultant Romel St. Hill, an attorney at law and managing director of Lex Romolus Inc., who was contracted to garner the input of stakeholders on the proposed new legislation for the elderly in his address at the National Consultation today, presented the findings of the widespread consultation held. He noted that on the the preliminary report shows uh, that due to the pandemic and volcanic eruption, SVG is facing increasing issues with regards to the elderly and in need for better psychosocial services for the elderly. So you do have some very essential services within St. Vincent and the Grenadines, within the government itself, Ministry of National Mobilization, and the private sector as well in terms of the elderly care homes. So as alluded to, you have a number of challenges. There have been increasing instances of abandonment. There have been increasing notices of persons being abused. It was also mentioned in terms of employment. There is discrimination in terms of ageism. Basically, once you reach a certain age, they don't want to see your face anymore. They don't want you at the front desk and that type of thing. So these are very present issues which are being faced in the island itself. With regard to land tenure, you have a older parent or grandparent, um, you more or less think this is your house now, it's, time, it's your time to shine and you kind of want to put them away in a room on a corner, although it is their property and their name. Um, there's also the issue of financial security. As you get older, what have you put in place? 
um, for your golden years. Similarly to that, and I'll come to that, what if you do have mechanisms in place, but you have persons taking advantage of that? So we have to look at that as well. It's also saw that there's a need for older persons to, contri to continue to contribute to society, so to have a mechanism in place, at least to get that information of the cultural icons which they would have had, um, to kind of at least have a database so that when future generations come, they can at least access what would have happened before, like a national archive in that area. Similarly, because of the non-communicable diseases, the easy access to everything, there are high instances of this, so therefore we need to look at health and well-being as persons get older, and as well as how they advance in age. So this is more or less some of the initial findings. In other news now, we hear that a number of persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are living in the pre-diabetic stage. This is according to family nurse practitioner Laura Alfred, who on NBC Radio face-to-face -face program today noted the importance of educating children on diabetes and other non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Alfred said the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment took the lead in this regard by hosting camps in Georgetown, Beckway and Maraqua, speaking with children in the age group 12 to 16 years. What happens in this stage determines if you go back to normal or you move on to actually living with diabetes. Mm -hmm. So we target that for the children. Also obesity. Because obesity and being overweight contributes to diabetes. It's a risk factor. There are a number of persons who have their children and oh my baby is chubby and my baby is fat and fluffy mm -hmm. and they figure that that's the way to go mind you i'm not saying if you're fluffy and chubby that you're not, not healthy. healthy right but i'm saying that is the mindset so we want to educate the populace and in educating the populace we have to start with the children because you know it's always cool <laughs> yeah. and <laughs> um, you believe the half truth, so you, you try and take some from what the picnic niggas say. Mm -hmm. So we try to zoom into that age group to get the message home. Some of these children are actually coming from homes where persons are living with diabetes or high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And you have to assist granny because granny eyesight not too good. Mm -hmm. So granny would call it, boy, where the number on this machine here say? Because I ain't I think I could take the whole 50 units of insulin with doctor tell me I have to take this mm -hmm. morning. Right. You know that kind of thing? Yeah, uh -huh. So <laughs> we want them to know what is happening so they can assist and guide in the homes that they're coming from. They can meet somebody on the road and they also too can assist and share the knowledge. So it's like we're putting our feelers and stretching out our tentacles right. in this age group. Alfred say they will continue to educate the Vincentian public on NCDs including at the various educational institutions. Once you knowledge is power, so I'm one who believe that once you have somebody with the knowledge, they can make an informed decision. The talks that the team would have sat down and when we did our mini debriefing post-mortem is that we want to partner with the Ministry of Education okay. to go into the secondary schools. Because we could target the primary schools as well, the grade six, but you know at around that time, they more focus on CPA mm -hmm. examination. So we talk and the, the information might just go over their head. But if we get into the, the higher schools, so the secondary schools, the vocational schools, even the community colleges, mm -hmm. and we educate individuals on what is happening, then we would have a populace who would have a better understanding of what is happening and what they need to do. Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Sinclair Prince, had indicated earlier that this year the ministry will be focusing heavily on NCDs, which are said to be killing Vincentians at an alarming rate. As part of efforts to deal with the problem, the health clinic at Enums has been retrofitted and is now serving as a national health and wellness center with specific focus on diabetes. 
in more local news now, we hear the Institute of Governance and Politics of Latin America and the Caribbean was launched here last evening by the ruling Unity Labour Party. The launching event was held at the Methodist Church Hall in Kingston under the theme, Building Future Leaders Today. Minister of Urban Development, Energy, Seaport Administration, Grenadines Affairs and Local Government, Binava Brown, said the notion that everyone has a role to play in national development and growth cannot be overstated and that the mission of the Institute of Governance and Politics of Latin America and the Caribbean fully aligns itself with such notion. So why is civic responsibility critical for the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines? It was only until 1951 that we received the right to vote. This is something that we must not forget. We are currently in a position where we can right some of the wrongs that were made during the colonial era of our history. Many of the laws are in need of updating to reflect the modern Caribbean society which we now live in. Secondly, for a more inclusive development where all social groupings, especially disadvantaged groups, have a voice in mainstream development, this brings its benefits to all. Experiences from other Latin American and Caribbean countries give us the opportunity to learn and adapt some of the good ideas and avoid pitfalls. Knowledge is power, after all. Working together can create synergies and energies to propel the development process. But working together also creates great network linkages from one group into another. The development of relationships and communities are priceless and the impact immeasurable. Friendships can create a base for development of well-rounded individuals who can serve the national good. Embracing civic responsibility for us, good society can offer great rewards, including fulfilling one purpose and realization of the community goals and even wider national goals. It brings joy in a sense. Apart from tackling social issues in the communities, participants experience joy engaging in their agency and contributing towards social good. Noting that data and information collection have a critical role to play in higher levels of civic responsibilities in community and national development, with SVG often described as an information desert which hinders the development and execution of programs and projects. Brown said the Institute will add to the knowledge base. For as time progresses, articles, speeches, and other publications will be digitized, collected, and this institute will be a huge asset to young scholars locally, regionally, and even internationally. There's an appetite for knowledge and information about St. Vincent and the Grandines and the rest of the Caribbean and Latin America. In addition, increased civic responsibility can protect individual rights, promote the common good as mentioned before, provide economic security, mold the character of citizens, further the interests of certain groups and classes, promote religion, increase understanding of the importance and the relevance of public and government, and of civil society in the daily lives of all Vincentians. For example, their safety, security, education, employment, health, recreation, and overall quality of life. Promote, promote, it can also promote the development of civic character, fostering the recognition of public and private responsibility, and encourage the adherence to values and principles of constitutional democracy. Brown also told the gathering at the Methodist Church Hall that in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we must become more civic-minded and work together because of our high levels of vulnerability and developmental challenges. I can stand here and I can tell you how vulnerable we are. I can tell you the World Bank statistics and all that it says and all the development constraints that come with being a small island developing state. But I think we've all heard those before. <laughs> so I would skip that. <laughs> So, why should we care or why should you care? Imagine a St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where everyone, including youth, takes responsibility and promotes social good through disciplined action. The results will be unprecedented. With, redu with reduced crime, increased volunteerism, 
higher levels of education, greater participation in sports and in culture, and maybe an end to political tribalism. We can no longer shy away from the conversations of individual and collective participation for nation building in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the transformation. As citizens, everyone has a role to play. One person negligence has a ripple effect on others. We must again ask ourselves, if not me, then who? If not, when? If not now, then when? And Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Kiesel Peters in her address at the launch and ceremony said governance and politics are global phenomena and understanding global affairs help individuals and nations to anticipate and prepare for potential opportunities, changes and oftentimes challenges. In matters of global affairs, we must be aware. Be aware that a global pandemic arrested economic growth. Be aware that the Caribbean is one of the most vulnerable regions in the world. Be aware that this said vulnerability affects the pace and extent of our development. Be aware that when we speak of development, we must place it in its proper context, historically and contemporary. Be aware that the current international financial architecture was not designed with small island developing states in mind. Be aware that sanctions not only affect the intended countries, but also their neighbors who surround them. Be aware that during the 12th ministerial conference of the World Trade Organization, over 100 member states took to the floor to debate many issues, including the disruptions in the supply chain and the rising cost of living. Be aware that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been a leading advocate on these and many other issues affecting the region. Before the dawn of the ULP administration, foreign policy was a foreign concept that was unknown and unappreciated by many Vincentians. Since then, the thrust of this government to refine and define this country's foreign policy and to expand our diplomatic engagement has resulted in what I can only describe as a sweeping wave of enlightenment across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Minister Peters further told the gathering that in an interconnected world, events in one part of the globe can have far-reaching impacts on another regions, and that by being properly informed about global affairs enables individuals to make informed decisions as citizens, consumers, and as advocates. It empowers people to engage in discussions about critical issues and contribute to positive change. Of equal importance, knowledge and understanding of governance and politics is an essential tool for active citizenship, effective advocacy, positive contributions to societal progress, and shaping a more sustainable and secure future for all. I often speak about the wealth of institutional knowledge which our Prime Minister possesses and how he unselfishly, unselfishly transfers knowledge to members of the younger generation, thereby paving the way to build tomorrow's leaders today. The opposition leader questions the relevance of the education revolution, but the Prime Minister encourages young people to soar like eagles with their wings unclipped. While some leaders tell their young ones, know your place and wait for your time, my Prime Minister says to me and all of us, take your place and the time is now. Suffice it to say that all leaders are not the same. With his visionary leadership, 
Dr. Gonzalez was the guiding force for the establishment of this Institute of Governance and Politics of Latin America and the Caribbean. And I take this opportunity to commend and thank him for facilitating the continuous pursuit of knowledge. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, who delivered the feature trials at the launching of the Institute, said its focus is education, research, publication, and advocacy on matters touching and concerning governance, politics, and the political economy of the Caribbean and Latin American civilizations and their historical contemporary manifestations. Inclusive of their dialectical interconnections between and within both our hemispheric civilizations and others globally. The Institute is being managed by a 16-member board of directors chaired by me. Its director, the executive director, is Augustine Ferdinand, whom I've indicated to you. is a graduate of the University of the West Indies. He's 29 years of age. He's also the secretary to the board. The Institute is headquartered at Morris Road at the location of the headquarters of the Unity Labour Party. I must give you the formal stuff. I said just now that the focus of the Institute is education, research, publication and advocacy on matters touching and concerning governance, politics and the political economy of our Caribbean and Latin American civilizations. And there are interconnections, there are multiple interconnections. Education. Education has fundamentally four functions. And the education revolution in this country, which as Kisal pointed out to you shortly, short while ago, that the leader of the opposition has questioned its relevance. While they question the relevance, we build in educational institutions and we further in the education revolution. They can go ahead. <laughs> Incidentally, questioning the relevance of education, and especially post-secondary and university education, is a preoccupation in the Western world today of right-wing peoples, Trump and the Tories, Trump in America and the Tories in the conservatives in the United Kingdom. And anytime you hear anybody talks like that, they're bedfellows of the right-wing conservatives in the world. They are on the wrong side of history. They can look forward to the past, knowing that the future is behind them, while we move triumphantly to deal with problems today for the future. 